As regular viewers of this channel know, an eerie number of cases seem to take place in quiet little towns, and today's first entry is no exception. La Bulache, Argentina, a community of about 20,000 residents. A peaceful place far removed from the violence often seen in larger cities. The perfect place for a kid to grow up. On the afternoon of June 29th, 2023, 14 year old Joaquin Sperani rode his bike to school as per usual, though strangely didn't attend any of his classes. Instead, he left the premises with his lifelong best friend, a 13 year old known only as L. The two boys had been close since elementary school, and their families often spent time together. That previous year, L had requested a school transfer so he could spend more time with his closest companion. Joaquin was an introverted soul who had few other friends, and who was often the target of bullies, and so, naturally, he was over the moon with Elle's decision. That lunch break, the pair were captured by a local resident's security camera, walking side by side in the opposite direction of the school. This still shows them smiling and laughing. Unbeknownst to all but one person, it would be the last image captured of Joaquin, alive. Minutes later, that same camera caught footage of L returning to school grounds alone. He re-entered his classroom and sat in his usual spot. His classmates noted that he behaved normally, playing and laughing throughout the rest of the day. When Joaquin didn't return home that evening, his parents contacted the school's headmaster. When they learned that their son hadn't even attended any of his classes, the Sparanis immediately reported him missing. Investigators quickly found Joaquin's bicycle which was still chained up outside the school, yet there was no trace of the boy anywhere. After talking with members of staff, one eagle-eyed teacher mentioned that their student, L, had been using a different cell phone to the one he typically carried. L was questioned by detectives shortly thereafter, and they quickly determined that the boy's new cell phone was actually Joaquin's. The case had been painted in an effort to disguise it. L claimed that Joaquin had given him the phone as a present before running away from home, apparently fed up with the school bullies. Frustrated with what they considered to be passive police work, the missing boy's neighbours and family members took to the streets and conducted their own investigation. On Sunday, July 2nd, a search party entered an abandoned house on 480 Sarmiento Street, just a hundred metres from the school. One member recalled what they found. We were walking with two of Joaquin's cousins when we passed an abandoned house. We went inside, and as soon as we entered, we saw the corpse. The cousins started screaming. It was like a horror movie. After discovering the body, El confessed that he and Joaquin had gone to the house together. They had apparently gotten into an argument there. A fight broke out, and El killed Joaquin in self-defense. Thing is, Joaquin had suffered 18 blows to the head. At the crime scene, police found an iron pipe and a piece of concrete, both stained with blood. A lack of defensive wounds suggested that Joaquin had actually been caught unawares and struck from behind. Certain that there hadn't been any argument and that Joaquin's murder was actually premeditated, officers conducted a search of El's house. In the young boy's room, they found a stuffed animal with a piece of paper hidden inside. A note which bore Joaquin's name and that of another boy, along with the unsettling message. Mum will soon forget about this. This discovery led Joaquin's family to fear that another classmate may have been El's next intended victim. Due to his age, El couldn't be prosecuted in Argentina. He was held in a juvenile detention center for three months before being released to live with his family he'll face no further consequences for his actions. In the minds of many local residents, it's only a matter of time before he indulges in his twisted fantasies once again. Maintaining a good work-life balance can be challenging, especially when you're swamped with multiple projects. When I first started this channel, for instance, there never seemed to be enough hours in the day. But today's sponsor, Stamps.com, helped me to reclaim a lot of that precious time. Stamps.com is like a 24-7 post office in your pocket, streamlining all of your postage needs so you can focus on what really matters. With Stamps, you can handle mailing and shipping wherever you are, even on the go. 
All you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale to get started. Scheduling package pickups is a breeze through the stamps.com dashboard, and they automatically tell you the cheapest and fastest shipping options from different carriers. It seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart, giving you access to the USPS and UPS services you need, anytime, day or night. But my favourite thing about stamps is the crazy discounts you can't find anywhere else, up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. Whether you're a small business owner or running a multi-location organisation, sign up at stamps.com forward slash lazy masquerade for a special offer that includes a four week trial, free postage and a free digital scale. No long term commitments or contracts, just go to stamps.com forward slash lazy masquerade. Shrouded in secrecy, North Korea remains one of the most enigmatic places on Earth. The rogue nation has long been a magnet for the morbidly curious, in large part because her all-powerful leaders have such a tight grip over their subjects. They have full control over what people can and can't say, how they can and can't style their hair, even over who can and can't exist. One of the few ordinary North Koreans to improve their lot in life was Wu in He. Born in Kaohsiung, her exact date of birth remains a mystery, though it's believed she was born either in the late 1930s or early 1940s. Described by her family as a selfless bubbly girl who loved to dance, a young in he spent the Korean War helping her relatives scrape by, and came close to losing her life several times as bombs struck her hometown. That tough childhood instilled in her a desire to live in the moment and chase her dreams, and so, after the conflict, Inhi moved to Pyongyang to pursue a career as an actress. Her charisma and good looks served her well, and just one year after arriving in the capital, Inhi landed the lead role in the tale of Cheongyang, catapulting her to instant stardom. She went on to feature in dozens of successful films, including The Girl from Diamond Mountain, a movie in which she portrayed a character through all the stages of her life, from childhood to old age. Inhi received numerous awards, was honoured with the prestigious title of The People's Actress, and was considered by many to be the most beautiful woman in the Hermit Kingdom, with a curvy figure, a round face, and a girl next door charm. Her remarkable achievements drew the personal interest of many powerful individuals, not least the future supreme leader, Kim Jong Il. At that time, Kim was the second most powerful man in the country, just behind his father, and being both a fan of Inni's work and beauty, Kim granted her the rare privilege of travelling to Czechoslovakia to study acting. Inni would go on to marry Yu Ho Sun, the most renowned movie director in the DPRK, and together the pair had three sons. They also had what we'd now call an open relationship, with Inni becoming involved with a number of her work colleagues. By the late 1970s, rumours about her many affairs had spread widely leading to her workmates confronting her during a mutual criticism session, whatever that is. Inhi defiantly pointed out that many of her accusers were themselves involved in the affairs, making them hypocrites and no better than her. What followed this session can only be described as a monumental fall from grace. Inhi was stripped of her title as the People's Actress, blacklisted by the industry, and since she was effectively owned by the studio, was assigned a punishing job tending the boiler room for 12 hours each day. In 1979, Inhi was unexpectedly allowed to return to acting, and was even cast in leading roles again. Coincidentally, it was around that time that she began a new affair with her secret admirer, one Kim Jong Il. It's widely believed that in exchange for her body, Kim offered to restore Inhi's career. Inhi did agree to Kim's proposal, Though in reality, it's hard to know whether their relationship was consensual. After all, refusing the heir apparent would have likely meant death, or even worse, life in a labour camp. Taking one look at this potato, I'm more inclined to believe that Inhi felt forced into the deal. Well, willingly or not, Inhi would covertly meet with Kim at his request. Once he was satisfied, Kim would remind Inhi to keep her lips firmly sealed. Nobody could know that their future leader was an adulterer. 
Well aware of the potential consequences if she blabbed, Nini promised to never speak a word of their affair, not even to her own husband, ho Sun. To be on the safe side, Kim had another actor shadow her and report on her activities. She would be monitored for the rest of her life. After her relationship with Kim, Inyi fell madly in love with a young Zainichi Korean who had moved to the DPRK for work. She was initially hesitant to date the man, fearful of what may happen if Kim were to find out, but the Zainichi eventually won her over. Since it was too risky to meet in public, they spent their time together driving around in his Mercedes. In the winter of 1980, the pair were discovered in that same car. The engine was running, and they were both suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. The man was pronounced dead at the scene. His name has never been made public. Inni miraculously survived and spent two weeks recovering in hospital. She was approached by the police while still in a disoriented and distraught state and was subsequently forced to give a witness statement in which she let slip her belief that Kim Jong-il had tried to have her killed, citing their past romance as the motive. In her mind, Kim was either too jealous to let her move on or feared that she would eventually make their affair public knowledge. Trouble was, she just had. After being held for several weeks in an undisclosed prison, Inni was told that she was free to go. Smiling, she was led through a set of heavy-duty doors, ones that didn't lead onto the street, but rather onto the Kang Kon shooting grounds. Before she could ask any questions, Inni was tied to a post in front of a crowd of 6,000 spectators. In the front row was Kim Jong-il. He had ordered Inni to be executed for revealing details about their affair. Twelve gunmen then fired ten rounds each at her from their AK-47s, mutilating her body beyond recognition. Her husband, Hosan, was forced to witness the proceedings. Following her death, Kim annulled Inni and Hosan's marriage and forced the bereaved husband to star in the propaganda film Unsung Heroes. The 6,000 attendees who had been forced to watch the event were all ordered to remain silent, for if they spoke about what they had seen, they would face the same fate as Inni. Despite that warning, the incident soon became common knowledge. In an effort to destroy not only her body, but also any evidence of her existence, Inni's name and image were systematically erased from magazines and film catalogues, and she was edited out of the films that she had starred in. In some cases, her scenes were reshot with a different actress, and in others, her scenes were deleted entirely, rendering their plots incomprehensible. Given that she only enjoyed fame within North Korea, Kim Jong-il's erasing of Inni was hugely successful, with later generations believing her existence to be nothing more than a myth. Indeed, this once household name may well have been deleted from the annals of history, had director Shin Sang-ok not managed to smuggle a photo of her out of the country. Sang-ok was a South Korean who was abducted by Kim Jong-il in 1978 and forced to make movies for him, but the wily filmmaker refused to let Kim have the last laugh. He made secret audio recordings of his conversations with Kim, which further exposed his tyrannical nature, and thankfully, Sang-ok was able to escape the country in 1986 with his wife. In 1988, he released a book, one titled The Kingdom of Kim Jong-il. It was published in South Korea and Japan. One section tells the story of Wu Inni, and that page's accompanying picture, a still frame from the tale of Chung Yang, is one of the last images of the actress that exists today. As you can probably guess from his name, Count Xavier Dupont de Legon came from an aristocratic family, with his lineage including musketeers and even a castle in central France. Born with a silver spoon in his mouth, he rubbed shoulders with other noble children while growing up in Versailles, a wealthy suburb of Paris and the former haunt of kings and queens. 
Sabie met his future wife, Agnes, in the early 1980s, when he was 20 and she was 17. Though not as highborn as Sabie, Agnes came from a traditional, conservative background and held many of the same values as him. The pair quickly fell in love. However, the adventurous Xavier wanted to explore New Horizons while he was still young. Thus he broke up with Agnes and left to travel the world, a decision he soon came to regret. One year later, he returned to Versailles to find that Agnes was pregnant with another man's child. To his family's surprise, Xavier chose to marry Agnes and adopt her child, Arthur, giving him the prestigious Dupont de Lagon name. Marrying an unwed mother was nearly unheard of in Versailles at the time, but the couple went on to build a loving family in the city of Nantes, welcoming three more children into the world. Thomas, Anne, and Benoit. In 2011, the family were living at 55 Robert Schumann Boulevard, a modest house in an upper middle class neighbourhood. Xavier was known to be a devoted father who was deeply involved in his children's lives. They were all enrolled in either prestigious universities or private schools, and from the outside looking in, the Duponts were living the perfect, privileged life. Yet despite keeping up appearances, Xavier was harbouring a dark secret. His wealth was quickly running out. Having always relied on the family's coffers growing up, he had never had to make his own living, so now as a fully grown man, he had no idea how to. When asked what he did for work, He'd describe himself as a salesman, though always stayed vague with the details. He had started numerous businesses over the years, that much was true, but none of them had been successful. Between 2001 and 2011, he was in a, quote, downward spiral of failure, and was being hounded by debt collectors. This was playing havoc on the now middle-aged man's mind. Concerned, Agnes took to the online medical chat forum, Doctissimo where she described how Xavier had subtly commented, her group death as a family wouldn't be a catastrophe. Ominous. At around 2pm on April 11th, 2011, a neighbour noted that the Dupont family's house, which was typically full of life and noise, had been eerily silent for about a week. She tried to peer through the windows, but the shutters had been pulled. A note on their letterbox read, return all mail to sender. All of the family's cars were still outside the house, except for their Citroen C5, but if they'd gone on holiday, she thought, that vehicle wouldn't have been large enough to carry all six family members, their two Labradors, and their luggage. Over the next two days, that same neighbour observed the house and grew increasingly concerned, prompting her to contact the police. On April 13th, officers arrived to investigate. Everything appeared normal inside the residence though some of the beds had their sheets removed, and a few closets were open. The police initially believed that the family had left voluntarily, and saw no immediate cause for alarm. The following day, several friends and relatives received letters from Xavier and Agnes, ones which read, As you know, I've had connections with the US. The Americans have recruited me to infiltrate an international drug ring. This will be difficult. You won't see us for a long while as we're going to change our identities, be under protection, and won't be reachable at all. Now that was ominous. However, due to Xavier's esteemed status, many of his frankly eccentric loved ones believed the story outlined in the letter to be true. Agnes's family was far more sceptical. They forwarded the letter to the district attorney, adamant that she would have never left without calling them. The police returned to the family home four more times to conduct a more thorough investigation, but noticed nothing particularly suspicious, aside from some missing items. However, during their sixth visit on April 21st, a lieutenant discovered something under the terrace in the garden. Large plastic trash bags bound with tape. Inside the bags were several bodies, wrapped in blankets and duvets. One grave contained Agnes, Arthur, Anne. Benoit and the family dogs. Thomas's body was found in a separate hole. Xavier's was nowhere to be found. Though the exact date is contested, it's believed that Agnès, Arthur, Anne and Benoit were all slain in the early hours of April 4th. Later that day, Xavier called his son Thomas at university and told him, 
Your mother's had a cycling accident. She's in the hospital, in a coma. We don't know if she'll come out of it. You'll have to come home. Upon his return, Xavier took Thomas out for dinner to discuss matters. Waiters at that restaurant recalled that near the end of their meal, Thomas had become noticeably sick. An autopsy revealed that all of the children had sleeping pills in their systems, so it's possible Xavier had slipped a sedative into his son's drink. The victims were found in their pajamas, suggesting that they were killed while sleeping in their beds. Strangely, there was no trace of blood in any of the bedrooms, nor in the living room, the foyer, or the bathroom. When crime scene investigators collected samples, they found no fingerprints or DNA on anyone. All five of them had been shot twice in the head with a 22 caliber rifle, though strangely again, none of their neighbors reported hearing loud bangs during the night. Three months before the murders, Xavier's father had passed away. His dad too had blown all of his money, but Xavier took it upon himself to clear out his father's apartment, perhaps in search of some valuables that he could sell. While doing so, he discovered his father's 22 caliber rifle. Prior to inheriting it, he had shown no interest in weapons at all. After acquiring it, however, he began learning how to shoot. He even took two of his sons to the range, where he asked the instructor several questions including one about using a silencer. Needless to say, Xavier was determined to be the prime suspect in the familicide. An international arrest warrant was issued for him, and detectives began scouring hotels and restaurants across France. Experts were able to build a timeline of events leading up to the slayings, one which highlighted just how thorough Xavier had been in his preparations. He had closed all of the family's bank accounts, bought a shovel and several bags of lime from different stores, had terminated Anya's employment, and unenrolled his children from their respective schools and colleges. After the family's lives ended, Xavier remained in the house for a week before going on the run, bouncing from hotel to hotel. On April 22nd, they found the missing man's car in the parking lot of a Formula One hotel in Roquebrune, sur Argent. After pouring through the building's security footage, they came across something disturbing. The last known images of Xavier Dupont, captured on April 15th as he was checking out of the hotel. The footage showed him walking away into the wilderness, looking back as if to acknowledge the camera. This still was released to the public. So what happened to Xavier? Well, it's worth noting that the area he was last seen in is surrounded by cliffs and mountains, leading many to believe that Xavier ended his own existence there. The police spent several weeks searching halls, caves and crevices in the area, but found no trace of the aristocrat anywhere. Some people speculate that Xavier outwitted everyone and successfully escaped overseas. In most cases of familicide, the perpetrator typically ends their own life on the spot, not a week and a half later. Xavier put considerable effort into deceiving the investigators at the crime scene, perhaps to buy himself more time. Some believe he managed to trick them twice, first by cleverly hiding his family's remains, and then by making it appear as if he had leapt from a cliffside. Records show that he didn't purchase any plane or train tickets in his own name, but Xavier could have easily taken a boat or used a highway or mountain path to reach Italy. He was multilingual and cosmopolitan, and could easily have started life anew in a foreign country. He was of average height and had no strong facial features and would have found it simple to blend in near most anywhere. Other people, like Xavier's sister, Christine, are adamant that the bodies found under the terrace weren't actually Agnes and the Dupont children. In 2012, she told the media, Xavier and his family left for the United States because their safety was threatened in France. The bodies found under the patio can't be those of Agnes and the children. Though that theory does sound outlandish, it is strange that the victims' remains were cremated extremely quickly, just a few short days after they had been discovered and examined. There were also supposed discrepancies between the heights and weights of the victims found at the home and those of the family members. Though the bodies shared the same common DNA, no samples were compared with living members of the Dupont family to confirm their identities. That could all be chalked up to police incompetence, but several witnesses including the family's neighbours and friends, attest that they had either seen or been in contact with Agnes and the children four or five days after they had supposedly been slain. 
Employing Occam's razor, the authority's working theory remains that Xavier did kill his family in order to save face. He was known to be a vain and proud man who would do anything to avoid being exposed as a failure, and they believe he wanted to prevent his children from discovering that he was broke. He then either ended himself in the wilderness, or jumped into the sea. In October 2019, a man suspected of being Xavier was arrested at Glasgow Airport in Scotland. His fingerprints partially matched Xavier's, but DNA testing confirmed he wasn't the missing aristocrat. Despite 900 other alleged sightings, Xavier de Pont de Lagon has never been found. Today, over a decade after vanishing, he remains a wanted suspect. Before we end, a huge thank you to my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon, especially my biggest supporters. Cool Dude Organ, George Lopez, Holly Lyons, Modest Bulbasaur, Alana Pons, Asia Mina, Azriel Warakai, Chief Kochuake, Colin Monsma, Connor Lothan, Sai Wazau, Fanzerus Papyrus, Farewell Tattoos Jack Seffel, Gina Valera, Grace Archie, Hamish, Ian Bullock, Misty Blue Longy, Peter Logdredge, TNS Mum, Terry Ford, Hamish K, LJB, Itai Allen, and Nefus1988. Thank you so much for your continued support.